Good evening again, everyone. Good to be back to do this fourth part of our series of uh, the dangers of secular psychology, mind games, the dangers of secular psychology. And before we begin, we want to start with a word of prayer again. Father, we thank you again that we could come to you. And as we do this last of this four-part series, we pray and we plead again for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you may continue to give me strength so that I may be able to explain these concepts clearly and that you will give the listeners a willing heart and a ready mind to accept what has been presented from your word and that they may be, may be like the Bereans, Father, to go back and, and study these things on their own. We thank you so much for the truths that you give to us. Now we pray for your Holy Spirit again to be with us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we've been talking about the dangers of secular psychology and we've, we've looked at the dangers of the idea in the first part that um, focusing on childhood is necessary for healing and, and how traditional therapy is carried out. And then in our second part, we looked at things such as self-esteem and the whole focus on needs. And in our most recent part, we looked at the idea of emotions and we looked at unconditional acceptance. I am just touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of looking at psychology and how it affects us. And something came to my mind before I go into this last part. There are also some aspects of psychology that actually has some spiritualistic roots that we need to be uh, careful of as well. I don't even really get into that into this presentation. But if you're really interested in that, I don't know how many of you all have heard of Dr. Edwin Noyes. He has the book Spiritualistic Deceptions in Health and Healing. And this is an Adventist physician from Oregon. He has a, a revised edition of that book that just came out recently. And in there, he spends, he has a chapter or two where he talks about the spiritualistic deceptions related to psychology. And if that's something that you're very interested in, you can Google his name, Edwin Noyes, N-O-Y-E-S, and look for his second edition that talks about some of the spiritualistic backgrounds of, uh, in psychology. Many of our psychology forefathers engaged in spiritualistic practices. They were involved with the cults. They were involved with other spiritualistic beliefs. And that's an even greater reason as to why we need to be careful with some of the theories that we take in. I heard one person say it real well one time when he says, we pick the fruit, but we don't look at the root. And we need to be careful. You know, some people think they can do yoga. Well, I'm not going to do the meditation the way they do it. You're picking the fruit and you're not looking at the root. We have to look at the roots of things that we do. So if that's an area that you're interested in, because I don't talk about it in these presentations, neither do I talk about it in my book, Christians Beware the Dangers of Secular Psychology, you might want to check him out. Edwin Noyes, N-O-Y-E-S, um, Spiritualistic Deceptions in Health and Healing. Now, we were, we were focusing on, uh, towards the ending of our last session, we were looking at moving away from the dangers of secular psychology. And I talked about looking at concepts in the eyes of the Bible and trying to see and use the Bible to test every theory or opinion that you come across. And in 1 um, <coughs> Thessalonians, or 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, Paul tells us this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. And I kind of started this in the last session when I talked about the Bible has many principles that we can use to help people with their emotional difficulties, with their psychological different difficulties. And I'm, I'm going to continue with that focus here. We're told by the servant of the Lord that the true principles of psychology are found in where? The Holy Scriptures. Servant of the Lord wasn't against psychology, but she wanted us to follow the true principles of psychology, and she states that they are found in the Holy Scriptures. And let's talk a little bit about this. We started talking about that earlier. I mentioned about guilt earlier and mentioned about using Psalms such as Psalms 32 and Psalms 51 to help people deal with guilt. There's another principle in psychology in, in um, looking at the area of guilt that we can find, I'm sorry, a principle in the Bible that's psychological in nature that can help in dealing with guilt, and that's the whole thing about confession. Uh, we're told, he that covereth his sins shall what? Not prosper, 
but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confession is very important. I think I mentioned that before in my last presentation. And in 1 John 1, 9, we read, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm kind of repeating some of these things, but they said repetition is, is good for learning. Amen? So the idea of understanding the importance for, co of, for confession if you're dealing with guilt is very, very important. Very important to keep in mind. And I mentioned the person that I mentioned that to, uh, dealing with uh, sexual offending, molesting children, and how I mentioned that to him. And he said that it felt like a burden was lifted off of his shoulders. And I, I don't know what happened to this gentleman, but I was glad that I was at least able to share this with him before I continued, in, uh, before he went on to whatever, I don't remember what happened to him, if he was transferred to somebody else, but I no longer saw him after that, but the Holy Spirit gave me that opportunity. And I also talked about the addictive cycle and how guilt can keep us going if we don't recognize that are important for confession. Um, and uh, uh, importance of looking, using guilt in the right way. Now another way I wanna, I'm just gonna use the Bible to, to, to practically talk about the, some things. Another thing I wanna talk about is the whole area of managing stress. I used to do a lot of stress management workshops and I would talk about time management and making sure you know how to say no and on and on and on. But there's also some principles in the Bible that we can use to help with, with stress. That whole part of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 6, 25 on, where it talks about which of you by taking thought can do such and such and such and such. If you really understand the principles in there, it can really help with anxiety and with stress. For example, um, we can be assured that God will take care of us and we don't need to worry or have to deal with or, or allow the stressful things in our lives to overwhelm us if we really study nature and see how God takes care of the various parts of his nature. You know, we see the birds, we see the field, the, the flowers of the field. All of these things are cared for by God. And if he cares for these things, he will definitely care for us. And these are just things sometimes that go into one ear and come out another. We say these things, but we really have to, by faith, ask God to help us to start to internalize these principles. Um, worrying will not change anything. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto unto his stature. You ever heard this expression, worrying is like a rocking chair, gets you nowhere? It really does. But in order to really um, be able to put worry in its proper perspective, we need to understand what God's word says about it. And also this thing I mentioned in an early presentation about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and really believing that all these things will be added unto you and really understanding and taking that in. And then the other part of that um, Sermon on the Mount says, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. When my husband first died, the first thought that came to my mind was, he was half of my ministry. How am I gonna be able to continue and support myself being that I left my practice? And this verse came to my mind where I said to myself, just deal, deal with each day as it comes along. And that's been a lifesaver for me, brothers and sisters. I can personally give you a testament, testimony of that. It's been a lifesaver. I still don't know wh which direction my ministry is going. I'm st still evolving because we had a whole different, sort of different kind of ministry. But if I keep this ever before me, it helps tremendously. Doesn't mean I don't feel the pain of the loss. Doesn't mean that I don't hurt that I still don't cry sometimes. But I, I remember a young man saying this really well. He says, we can move forward with God's promises in spite of how we feel. In spite of how we feel, we can move forward with God's promises. And many of us are overwhelmed with anxiety and stress because we stay in that feeling and we don't move past that. And so the Sermon on the Mount, as simple as it may seem, is a powerful set of principles that can help us in dealing with stress and anxiety if we really allow God to be able to help us with that. Now, I mentioned earlier Pastor Dan Gabbert, who's a trained mental health counselor, and he works at Black Hills. He's come up with something that really shows how the Bible can be used to help. It's called Biblical Response Therapy. He's actually written a manual on this. He's at Black Hills, and I've referred many people to him because they can go down there and do the whole lifestyle program and also have him as a counselor. But what he's done is that, th I'll read it to you, the goal is to help people identify and understand how their perception and their response to life, how they're perceiving and responding to life in an unhealthy manner and teaching them how to replace this with thoughts, 
feelings and actions that are in harmony with God's word. And if you go through his book, he has a section that talks about freedom from guilt. He has a section that talks about anger. He has a section that talks about understanding how we need to replace our thoughts. You know, the, the, the thing is about thoughts. I have a whole presentation that talks about what you think you become. You will be amazed how much thoughts gets us into problems. It's not what happens to us, but it, it's what we think about what happens to us that gets us in trouble. And that's one part of psychology that I do agree with, that whole area of cognitive behavior therapy, although my disagreement with them is that they just focus on behaviors and we really need to focus on changing the heart for true lasting change to come. But from a secular perspective, cognitive behavior therapy has helped some people. And what it does, it's just basically helping people to recognize the, the thoughts that are hurtful and replace them with more helpful thoughts, all right? And so when we talk about, um, understanding biblical response therapy. I just, I wanted to bring that up to show you that there are people out there who's trying to come up with models that fit more of the Bible. That's why I bring his name up. And he's one of the few. Of course, we know all the work that Dr. Neil Nedley has done as well. All of these things can help us to be able to deal with emotional problems better. And the Bible is a basic um, foundation for much of this. Another principle that can help us as we seek to move away from the dangers of psychology and this is something we hear all the time, but I'm going to put it out there and we're going to talk about it. Recognizing the importance of a converted, sanctified life. It's important, brothers and sisters. Remember I mentioned my family members who do marital seminars, but now they start out with making sure that people understand conversion. A couple needs to be converted in order to be able to get along better. And it's not only for couples. I do phone counseling sometimes, and I was talking to a young lady, and the mother was trying to talk to the, lady, to the young lady about a particular area that she wished that her daughter would change. And I said to her, the mother, the daughter's past, I don't want to give too much information because I like to things com uh, keep com things confidential, but she was an older teenager, let's put it that way. And I said to the mother, you can try to, you can try to talk about this, you can try to preach this as much as you, as you want, but when your daughter becomes converted, that's when she'll grasp the principles. It's plain and simple. But people want to come to me as a psychologist to change their children. And after a certain age, children and, and adolescents have made up their minds about what they're going to do. Preaching at them, nagging them will not change them. What your prayer needs to be now is, Lord, help my daughter to know you. Help my son to know you. The importance of a converted, sanctified life. Sanctification is not such, just some pie-in-the-sky concept. We talk about it a lot, but we don't make it practical, and we don't teach enough about it as well. I don't hear many sermons about helping people understand what sanctification means and how to apply that practically. In fact, I'm still learning myself as I read trying to understand that not only to help me, but to help other people. And in our church, many of the problems we're experiencing in families, in marriages, in the church itself is because we're not converted. We might be conservative in our thinking, we might agree there should be a certain style of worship we should have. There are certain prob um, 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 programs we shouldn't have. Oh, we're good with those kind of things. But when it comes to our heart really being changed and really having a connection with the Lord, we're lacking in that. And because of that, we run to these um, principles of secular psychology. In 1 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul talks about this. This know also that in the last times, Last days, perilous times shall come. And this is the part. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And Paul tells us from such turn away. Paul was speaking to us as Christians in the church. We have the form, but we don't have the power. And I'm, I'm emphasizing this it's because I believe this lack of power is what leads us to run to secular people or to run to Christians who are using secular methods because there's a hole there. There's something missing, and we don't have the power, we don't have the Holy Spirit, so we're looking for something to fill that hole. And all we're doing is drinking from broken cisterns because the water's going right out. It's going right out. It's not, we're not holding the water with these methods. Um, what does it mean to have a form of godliness? The best definition or description I found was actually through our SDA Bible commentary. A form of godliness refers to the external characteristics of religion. I come to Sabbath school, I come to prayer meeting, 
I worship the correct way. All of these are the external characteristics. But the power thereof is that power of God which cooperates with the will of man for the eradication, eradication making up my own word here, of all sinful tendencies. That's what the power of God will do. Do you believe that God can eradicate your sinful tendencies? Do you really believe that? If we believe that, we would see some different things happening in our lives that we're not seeing happening now. I'm going to be honest and confess to you. I'm just starting to believe that. I've spouted it off for years, but I'm just starting to actually believe that God can eradicate my sinful tendencies. And I would dare say, if I were to come to you personally one-on-one, you haven't believed this for too long yourself, many of you, if you believe it at all. And it's shown in some of the problems that we're having that's causing us to turn to secular psychology. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life, sinful thoughts are put away, evil deeds are renounced, love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness. This is what happens when the Spirit of God is in our life. And if you come to me as a psychologist wanting help, as a Christian and as a Seventh-day Adventist who believes in the power of the gospel, the first thing I should be doing is helping to understand where is your walk with the Lord? What do you do to develop and, 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 and encourage that walk with the Lord? A woman called me one time on the phone, and she was dealing with an eating disorder. And I, immediate, immediately I said to myself, and to her, this is not really a phone consultation kind of problem, but uh, I really would like to see you at some type of center where you could get the lifestyle measures and the spiritual counseling. But she says, I can't go to one right now. Well, I said, let's see what we can do. And I spent time talking to this lady, young lady, about her devotional time, about really believing that God has the power to give her um, um, what she needs to overcome this. She tended to binge. She would binge, and then she would take a laxative to purge. Okay? And I talked to her about understanding what she was telling herself about this, and I used the Bible a lot to help her with that. And I said to myself, Lord, this is the best I could do. I can't send this woman. She, she doesn't have the resources to go to a lifestyle center. I didn't know what would happen. Two weeks later, I received a call from this woman, and she said, based on what we talked about, I've started to develop my life with the Lord. I've developed a stronger relationship with him. I've developed a strong devotional life, and this is the first time I can say I have not binged for two weeks. Not only had that happened, but she was having some problems personally that was preventing her from getting pregnant. She said, a month later, I found out, she says, guess what? I'm pregnant. Now, this doesn't always happen this quickly, brothers and sisters, but by pointing out to her um, the need for her to strengthen her relationship with God and by her following through with that, she was able to see some changes. And it can happen with any problem that you're dealing with. Not everybody's going to have some qu- such quick results. I always want to say that when I give these stories so that you won't be discouraged and if you go out and try these, things don't happen as quickly for you. But I do want to give you these stories to encourage you and help you realize that God's principles can work. And developing a life with him and understanding sanctification and spending time to get to know him can, uh, can address many of the problems that we're dealing with. I want to put up another quote that's related to this. Um, Because sometimes we think it happens instantly, and it doesn't. While the change in the direction of the life is instantaneous, when one is converted, you're, you're instantly changed. Growth and development of the true Christian is continuous, and how long? So because you're converted doesn't mean all your problems will go away. Sometimes it'll take a while for you to move past some of the things that are plaguing you. But as long as you by faith believe that when I commit my, myself to God and I develop a, a, a devotional life, a relationship with him, I spend time talking with him, I spend time contemplating him, change can occur, brothers and sisters. I truly believe that. And that's what, when you're looking for a counselor, you want to find a counselor who's going to help you move in that direction. And that person does not have to have a PhD in psychology. There are many people who are biblically sound who can help you with that. And that's what I think we should be looking at more in terms of getting help. Now, um, the other thing that I want to talk about when we, when we think about moving away from psychologists 
psychology, secular psychology, is when we think about the whole area of worship styles and church programs. Another point to consider is that we must not get caught up with how the world and how other churches define success. That's real important. I mentioned that in another um, presentation or some, one of these seminars. We often tend to look at numbers. The more numbers we have, the more successful our church is, and that's not always the case. Um, when we look about, when we think about sermons and we think about worship styles, I often, not only worship styles specifically, but sermons, I often want to go back to Peter's sermon. Remember Peter's sermon when he was after, on the day of Pentecost? His sermon violated many of the things that secular psychologists say we should do. And let, let me, that'll make sense. Let, let's look at this. This is part of his sermons. I just pulled out different parts. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, if I was a secular psychologist, and I just pulled some things out, but if I were to read that chapter, I would say this man is really going to turn off people because he's accusing them of what they've done. He's not being politically correct. He's not making them feel good about themselves. He's making them feel guilty. This is horrible for their psychological health. But look at what the servant of the Lord says. The people were made to see themselves as they were, sinful and polluted, and Christ as their friend and redeemer. They were led to see themselves as sinful and polluted. They weren't conceived. Peter wasn't concerned about how they felt about themselves. And look at the result. You know it when you read through Acts. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? He didn't raise their self-esteem. He didn't make sure that he stayed away from pointing guilt and, and, and pointing out sin and, and them feeling guilty. And they actually responded in this way. And what happened? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I just gave this as, a, as an example. We don't believe, many pastors don't believe that when we really point out people's condition, and that when we really point out that they need a savior and what they've done, what was wrong, was wrong, we don't believe that this will bring in people into the church. And thus we use all of the gimmicks that secular psychology has to offer. But we have to move away from that if we really want truth growth to occur. And in terms of numbers, this is how God looks at the church. The church is very precious in God's sight. He values it not for its external advantages, but for the sincere piety which distinguishes it from the world. He estimates it according to the growth of the members in the knowledge of Christ, according to their progress in spiritual experience. When God is in heaven looking down at our church, he's not looking at the numbers. He's looking to see those of us who are in the church, how are we progressing spiritually? And secular psychology can't do much to help us pro project, uh, progress spiritually. This is another quote I want to put up. The world needs a practical demonstration of what the grace of God can do in restoring human beings. There is nothing that the world needs so much as a knowledge of the gospel's saving power revealed in Christ-like lives. That's what the world wants to see. We may think they want us to come in, they want to come in here and we can fulfill their needs, their felt needs and make them feel good and give them the music that they want and the sermons that they want. But what's really going to draw them is when they see the power of Christ in our lives. And I think that's one of the reasons our churches are not doing as they should because many of us don't have power. We have the forms, but we deny the power thereof. Now, I don't know if you remember this. This was in the Re Adventist Review about five, six years ago. A particular church that uses many of these secular psychological methods had to make a confession. And some of you all might have heard of this. Listen to what they said. We made a mistake. What we should have done when people crossed the line of faith and became Christians, we should have started telling people and teaching people that they have to take responsibility to become self-feeders. We should have taught people how to read their Bible between services, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. Did anybody see this in the review? Nobody did? This was a statement that actually came from Willow Creek. Have you all heard of Willow Creek? 
And Willow Creek, if you look at some of their beliefs and some of the practices, very psych secular psychologically based from the, some of the things that we're doing. But they came to the point to realize that their people were dying spiritually. And they said, we made a mistake. And they found out they should have been doing more to help people grow spiritually. Yet we're still following their practices. Willow Creek has had a big impact on all of, many of our Christian churches. Not as much now, it's more um, this, the uh, purpose-driven movement now. But these, at least they recognized that there were some things they were doing with all of their methods that wasn't really helping people grow spiritually even though the numbers were coming in. So this is a good example of, of, of and some of you may, have not have heard of, 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 may not have heard of Willow Creek. Uh, take some time to Google it if you're a person or to, to, to do some reading on it, but this is the whole church that brought in the whole, for lack of a better word, celebration worship kind of style that was, it's, it's in Chicago, outside of Chicago. It was actually featured on 60 Minutes once, and they were using all these methods to bring people in that we have emulated in many ways. And the ch churches were growing, but in a few years after that, they had to realize that they made a mistake in the direction they were going in. So I, I just thought I would mention that. Now, the other thing that we can do as Seventh-day Adventists, this message is, is specific to us now in terms of moving away from the dangers of secular psychology, is to understand our identity and our mission. I was listening to Pastor Bohr talking this morning about Israel of old and how if they had followed the plan God had for them, people would have been coming to them asking them, what are you doing? I want them to know the God that you know. Do you know God had that same plan for us as Seventh-day Adventists, brothers and sisters? People should have been running to us to find out what we're doing. And I brought this book because this is my book that is also sold by um, Secrets Unsealed. And, and Thomas Moster, I don't always pronounce his name correctly, he was your former Pacific Union Conference president. I don't know how many of you all have heard of him. He wrote a foreword for this book in talking about what Adventists have to offer. I have to read part of this foreword to, to you. Um, after seminary, this is Pastor Moster talking, I decided to pursue a degree in psychology. I began doing part-time classwork while pastoring. Early on, the chair of the psychology department, a Baptist professor, told me at the end of his class that he had all of Ellen White's books and, the, and that our church was wonderfully blessed with heavenly insights. He said that if people would simply follow scriptural principles and the additional insights of Ellen White, all but those with serious mental illness would find the answers to their problems without counseling a Baptist minister recognizes the message, the inspired message we have as Seventh-day Adventists. But like the woman who I said, um, let's look at child guidance, and she said to me, what can child guidance help me with this? Many of us are mimicking that kind of thinking when it comes to looking at what inspired writings have for us in terms of helping us with our mental health. But it, there's, a, there's a rich source of information in there. But before I talk about that, I want to mention that we have to recognize who we are and the mission that God has given to us. And when we truly become ingrained in who we are and, and the mission we have, we're not going to be as prone to run after these secular psychological principles to help us grow as people. This is what the servant of the Lord says about us. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as what kind of people? A peculiar people separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. You know, Satan wants to blot out that identity from us. He doesn't want us to remember the work that we have, and he wants us to be able to be so identityless that we'll grab on to whatever we can to help us with things. And you know, this teaching about who we are as Seventh-day Adventists should start from an early age. I don't know how many of you all grew up in homes where your parents sat you down and said, do you know what it is to be a Seventh-day Adventist? Do you know what that means? And, and kind of pointed it out to you to help you understand that. I would dare say most of us didn't grow up at homes in that way because our parents themselves didn't fully understand what that means. And here's what she tells us talking about children and parents, they should make them children 
makes, makes them, which is children, acquainted with the great pillars of our faith, the reasons why we are Seventh-day Adventists, why we are called, as were the children of Israel, to be a peculiar people. These things should be explained to the children in simple language, easy to be understood, and as they grow in years, the lessons imparted should be suited to their increasing capacity until the foundations of truth have been laid broad and deep. We should be teaching our children what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But many of us, unfortunately, are not doing this, and so we wonder why they're leaving the church. We're wondering why they can't keep, them, keep us, so we come up with all of these secular, psychologically-based ideas to keep them in the church. And if we had just taken the time, to, the time to explain to them, to help them understand, this would keep a lot of our young people in the church. It would keep a lot of our adults in the church, by the way, not only young people. And that's why Peter tells us, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises, which means virtues, of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvin, uh, marvelous light. The other aspect about Seventh-day Adventism, I kind of shared that with you in a previous presentation, and I don't want to get on the bandwagon for too long, and that's the whole idea about what we should be doing with our ministries. As Seventh-day Adventists, our ministries should have a different focus than the ministry and other churches. I know we have many needs um, and we, we have many things that we have to address, but unless we make sure that we put these needs in their proper perspective, we're, we're, we're going to be just like the other churches. And this is the quote I mentioned in another uh, presentation where the servant of the Lord tells us in welfare ministry regarding the work presented in Isaiah 58 about the true fast and how we should be helping other people. She says, the third angel's message is not to be given second place in this work but it is to be one with it. Do you all understand what she's saying? As you feed the hungry, as you clothe the naked, the third angel's message is not to be given second place. There may be, she goes on to say, and there is a danger of burying up, burying up the great principles of truth when doing the work that is right to do. Do you know in that book she also says that, um, I don't remember the exact quote, but her, the basic message is that we are not to be doing the same work as the Salvation Army. Have you all heard that quote? Do you know? We're, we're not. She's not knocking the work of the Salvation Army, but we have a bigger and better goal and role. And, and Pastor Boris explained it so well this morning. Our goal is to give the three angels message. That's what makes us different. We can be fulfilling the needs of, of people who have needs, don't get me wrong, but we cannot let this needs focus eclipse the, the, the mission that God has given us to let people know that we are in a judgment hour, helping people understand the, all the aspects about the, the third angel's message, and I think that's very important. There are some ministries that are doing the work of, of, of not only ministering to, meet, to needs, but trying to help people spiritually, and this was one that I found in a book, um, Must We Be Silent? It says, the women's ministry director of the Rwandan Union is at the forefront of women's evangelism. Last year, which was in 1999 when this particular um, uh, women's ministry was, m director was met, 5,000 people were baptized through evangelistic campaigns conducted by women. While eating in the home of this women's ministry leader, she explained to me that many of the women believe that the best way to say thank you to God for sparing their lives is to share the gospel. I put this up here because there's nothing stopping us from having some ministries do more evangelistic things. It's not only about fulfilling the needs of the people, of the people in the ministries. It's about evangelizing. And I, I want you to get that in your mind with all of your ministries, whatever ministries you are a part of. If evangelism is not a part of it, you're missing your goal as a Seventh-day Adventist. It needs to be part of your, min your, your ministry, very important. Now I'm going to switch gears. I read the story by Pastor Moster about the importance of the spirit of prophecy that was recognized even by a Baptist minister. And I'm just going to spend the rest of this time looking at spirit of prophecy, if you don't mind, and looking at some of the things that she has that if we followed, and some of us are following it, some of our churches are following, that would really help us. Um, in terms of keeping people or tr attracting people to the church, we don't have to use these needs-based kind of felt needs things. This is what she says. I have been informed by my guide that not only those who believe the truth, should those who believe the truth practice health reform, don't stone me, you're still gonna be my friend talking about health reform, right? 
<laughs> but they should also teach it diligently to others, for it will be an agency through which the truth can be presented to the attention of unbelievers. She goes on to say, they will reason that if we have such sound ideas in regard to health and temperance, there must be something in our religious belief that is worth investigating. She calls it the entering wedge, but we don't utilize it enough, brothers and sisters. We don't. My husband and I use this method a lot, and it got us into many first-day churches. And we did have people asking us more questions when they understood the health message as far as we could present it to them, and they saw changes in their life as a result. They were curious as to what other truths do you all have? It works, brothers and sisters. It really does, and we should be doing that more in our churches. And this is uh, something, uh, counsel she gives to us. She also says, in terms of keeping people in the church, they should enter heartily into the work of visiting and holding Bible reading with those newly come to the faith. When people come in, we shouldn't be concerned about them leaving if we teach them the truths of our church, teach them more things because we don't want them to feel as though they're not unconditionally accepted. We need to be going and studying the Bible more with them after they come in, and this will be a way to keep them, keep them in, in the church. And then with the youth, we're using a lot of our young people, but she says here, study how to win youth to Jesus. We have to study that. That's not something that just comes by osmosis. We actually have to study that through his word. We also have here in messages to young people about youth, we have an army of youth who can do much if they are properly directed and encouraged. Let all be so trained that they may rightly represent the truth, given the reason, giving the reason for the hope that is within them. Young people should be able to know how to defend what they believe in. And we should have classes to teach them about this. I'm sure if we were to do more of this, we may not keep all of our young people, but I believe we would keep more of them if we had these studies to help them understand what they believe in. And this is another principle related to young people in terms of keeping them in the church. There is need of representing genuine religion before the youth. Such religion will prove a vital power and all-pervading influence. And this is the religion that the youth must behold if they are to be drawn to Christ. This kind of religion will leave its divine impression upon souls. Sometimes we're losing young people because they don't see Christ in our own lives. And there's no impression being made upon them. Why stay here? I don't see what this is doing for my parents. I don't see what this is doing for the people in my church. What is there to keep me here? And we wonder why we're losing our young people, and we try to, again, use these gimmicks to try to keep them in the church, and it's not, it might keep them in, but they don't have the type of um, walk with the Lord that they should have. So I just thought she has a host of other information about keeping young people in the church and attracting members to the church and keeping members in the church. I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg just to show you what the spirit of prophecy has to offer. And then there's the whole aspect of lifestyle, understanding lifestyle and mental health. Dr. Neil Nedley has done a lot to bring this to the forefront. I wanted to show some of the things that the servant of the Lord said ab about this a hundred, over 150 or so years ago. She says, and if our brains are not clear, we may know that we have been transgressing some of nature's laws. This was interesting. She says, when my brain is confused, I know that I have been making some mistake in my diet. She knew that if her brain was not clear and she wasn't thinking clearly, there's something in her diet that she put in that was not good. That same principle can apply to us. And we've used this um, through um, the, uh, the work of Dr. Nedley, and, and I've, I do it myself in my work after reading much of his work. I, I try to help people to understand the importance of getting the brain healthy. If you're dealing with depression, if you're dealing with anxiety, you can come in and talk to me until the, the, um, the cows come home as, they, home, as they say. But if I'm not getting your brain healthy, it's going in one ear and coming out another. 
And these wonderful laws of health we have are not only for us for our high blood pressure to go down and cholesterol to go down, but it's also for us to have better functioning brains. And guess what? The world is starting to realize this. Look at this. Dr. Roger Wall, she's a psychologist. He reviewed several studies, research on the effects of what he calls therapeutic lifestyle changes, what's, he, what's also known as TLCs. And what's included in those therapeutic lifestyle changes? This should sound familiar. Exercise nutrition and diet, relationships, recreation, relaxation and stress management, religious or spiritual involvement. I told you psychologists can't run from that part anymore. They have to, to, to recognize it's important. Spending time in nature and service to others. And listen to what he says. His review reveals that lifestyle changes can be as effective as drugs or counseling for many mental health concerns. Isn't that amazing? We have this health message, and the world should have been running to us to say, how do you all deal with depression so quickly? How do you deal with anxiety so well? What is it that I can learn from you? And the laws of health that's been given to us now is being shown by research to be as effective as taking psychotropic medicines or just doing counseling. And this is a clear example of this, a study I ran across. In a study of 175 adults with bipolar disorder, Ellen Frank, PhD, found that those who improved regularity in their daily routines, such as regular sleep patterns, they averted or they were able to stay away or prevent new manic or depressive episodes longer than those who focused on regulating their mood symptoms and medications. Do you all know what this is saying? For a person diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and by the way, we could ho do a whole presentation on these diagnoses, you know, DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, is, is, is going to be growing even more because they're always adding diagnoses, you know, and that's a whole other topic. But we, do, we deal with what we have right now, okay? Bipolar disorder, people who have bipolar disorder, if you could just get them to have regularity in their schedule, it's as effective or more effective than some of the meds that they use or some of the counseling that you give to them to help them manage their moods. And when I say regularity, it means doing things on a regular schedule and keeping it around the same period of time. Most of us don't have a lot of regularity in our schedule. We eat breakfast 8 o'clock one day, 10 o'clock the next day, lunch at different times. But with these people, and even if our, in our own lives, we need to have a regular time where we're eating breakfast, eating lunch, and for those of us who eat supper. We, have, we need to have a regular time when you go to sleep and you wake up. I've done that with many people. People. A woman came to me, she was struggling with sleep problems, the doctor thought she was depressed, sent her to me, which is what doctors do when they can't deal with some of these problems, they think it's psychological, and the Holy Spirit said to me to ask her, did you ever do shift work? She was a patrol officer, highway patrol officer, she said, I did shift work for 18 years. And I said to her, the problem is, and that, at that time I had changed my whole way of working, your body clock is off, your circadian rhythm is off. So I worked with her, got her on a regular schedule. After two times of seeing her, she called and said, tell Dr. Parks, I, Parks, I don't need to come in anymore because I'm sleeping fine. Just regularity, simple things. that The servant of law talks about regularity in the book Councils on Diets and Foods. But this study shows that and just fits what she says. She says, the importance of regularity in the time for eating and sleeping should not be overlooked. She goes on to say in another book, there should be regular hours for rising, for family worship, for meals, and for work. And it is a religious duty to maintain this. Godliness, health, success, everything suffers from this lack of true religious system. So she's telling us, regularity is important for health, and then under that is mental health, and this study shows that. Um, Let's move on and talk about some other things that the servant of the Lord gives to us. Family problems, she says, or marital problems specifically. In every family, there are times of misunderstanding. There are times of misunderstanding. There are thoughts and feelings expressed that Satan takes advantage of. But if both husband and wife will resist the devil and humble their hearts before God, then the difficulties will soon be healed without leaving ugly scars. Powerful, powerful um, admonition for us. And of course, we need to have a converted, sanctified heart to be able to do this. This is a problem we women run into that I have to put up here for us. Sometimes we have problems in our marriages because of this. The women have had their imaginations perverted by novel reading, and I want to add nowadays TV, daydreaming, and castle building. 
They have a lovesick sentimentalism, constantly thinking they are not appreciated, that their husband do not give them all the attention they deserve. Sometimes we women get in problems because of the sentimentalism and this lovesick daydreaming that we engage in. I was guilty of this. I, I th when I first got married, I thought, every day Al is going to come home and bring me flowers. <laughs> and uh, Al was the name of my late husband. And I, when I found out that that wasn't true, based on what I had read about and, and watched on TV, it was really disappointing. But the, the idea is we have to get out of this as women because of the things that we put into our minds of how we think our husbands should be, and it causes marital problems. It really does. And men, I'm not going to let you get away without talking to you. Husbands should be careful, attentive, constant, faithful, and what? I don't hear any men. And what men? Compassionate. If he has the mind of Christ, he will be full of tender love. I see that in, in, in families, I see that. Men don't recognize that that tender love would lead to their wives doing many of the things they wish they would do or prevent them from doing many of the things that they don't want them to do. So the, I'm just looking at the counsel that she has for us. There's a lot more she has in Adventist Home and other books that helps with, can help with marital issues. And then when we talk about family issues, she goes on to say parents should in their words and deportments toward each other Give to the children a precious living exam example of what they desire them to be. If we want our children to be a, a certain way, we have to give them example, an example of what we want them to be. Plain and simple, sounds simple, but many of us don't do so. We wonder why we have problems. And this is interesting. When your children do wrong and are filled with rebellion and you are tempted to speak and act harshly, wait before you correct them. Give them an opportunity to think and allow your temper to cool. When people tell me that the spirit of prophecy doesn't have practical things, I want to say, what spirit of prophecy books have you read? She has so many practical things in there. I remember working with a young woman. I used to do evaluation. We call it Department of Family and Children's Services in Georgia. I don't know what they call it here. You know, the department that deals with children, child protective custody, uh, uh, protective custody and all of that. Um, but back there, I used to do evaluations sometimes to see if parents are fit, especially if the, if the child was found um, physically abused or something. And we had to evaluate them to see if the parents fit to take the child back into the home. And there was a woman that I was evaluating, and I wasn't doing counseling with her. I was just evaluating. And she had spanked her children in a way that sh shouldn't be spanked. I'm not against spanking, but there's a way that we should spank. Anyway, I talked with her. Holy Spirit impressed me to Xerox some pages from child guidance and give to her. I gave it to the woman. She came back because we had to finish up the testing. And she said, you know, I did nine weeks of parental training to try to get my children's ba children back. This book, whoever this person who wrote this, is a powerful writer. She said, I learned more from these pages that you gave to me than the nine weeks of parental training I did. Just by reading some of those books and child guidance. Powerful things. Another thing she says to parents, if you have failed in your duty to your family, Confess your sins before God. Gather your children about you and acknowledge your neglect. Sometimes we're wondering, how did my child turn out this way? Why are they more interested in religious things? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? If you truly go before the Lord, the Lord may reveal some things that you need to go to your child and apologize about. I remember hearing a pastor preaching about that, that the son had gotten older, left the church, and when he went to the church, to the child and apologized about some of the things he had done as a pastor, raising the child, this son eventually came back into the truth. Amen. Some of us need to do some confessing and some apologizing, whether that be to our children or to our um, spouses or whoever the case may be. So these are just some things. And the last area I wanted to focus on, I think this is the last area, is the whole area of happiness. She has a lot of quotes on happiness. She says here, so closely is health related to happiness that we cannot have the one without the other. Um, I'm sorry, we cannot have the latter without the former. If we're not healthy, it's hard to have happiness. Another quote on happiness in Steps to Christ. Happiness that is sought from selfish motives outside of the path of duty is ill-balanced, fitful, and transitory. You know, it's interesting, I just read a, a, a quote by a psychologist who was looking at some studies and, and, and doing some things, and the person says, when we reach, let's see if I can find it here, um, when we try to wish for happiness, this leads to unhappiness. If we're wishing for happiness, 
it leads to unhappiness. And what she was talking about is when we focus on things that are self-centered, when we focus on getting that car that someone else has or getting the house that someone else has that we want or the clothes or something, all these material possessions, this actually leads to unhappiness. And the servant of the Lord tells us this, sought, happiness sought from selfish motives is unbalanced, fitful, and transitory. And then in another quote she says, if the mind is free and happy from a consciousness of right doing and a sense of satisfaction in causing happiness to others, it creates a cheerfulness that will react upon the whole system, causing a freer circulation of the blood and a toning of the entire body. The blessing of God is a healing power. Some of us are wondering why we're suffering from not only mental problems, but even physical problems. It's because we're not doing as much as we can to help others. And as you see from here, it actually can have a physiological effect on us. So I wanted to just give you this overview of what the spirit of prophecy has for us in all areas of our lives. I mean, I could do a whole seminar on what the spirit of prophecy has for us. Let me give you another example that I like to tell people about. Desire of Ages, there's a little portion in there that talks about Christ being born, I think the word she used was illegitimate. Just a little section in there. There was a woman who came to me who had been through all this counseling. She had her PhD in something, 50-something years old, struggling because she was born out of wedlock and all of the rest of her siblings were, had the mother and father that was there. Had been, th all these, been through all these therapies and therapists and getting all the help she thought she could get and came to me. I just can't believe it. I don't feel good about myself. And the Holy Spirit impressed me to let her read that little part. She was a Christian. I read it, gave it to her, and she read it and came back and says, you know what? If Christ could be illegitimate and be okay and do the work God would have him to do, I can do the same thing. Did it take years of therapy for me to get her to agree to that? No. But just sharing that with her, understanding that Christ went through what she went through and was a powerful worker for the Lord and she recognized that she could be the same. The, 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 the spirit of prophecy is just wonderful with information in terms of helping people. And I just wanted to share that with you. And as we wrap up, I want you to realize that there is, as we draw to a close uh, in terms of the end of time, we have to recognize that God has allowed some of these principles of secular psychology to come into the church as he's allowed other false philosophies to come in. He's allowed it for a reason, brothers and sisters, and this verse is one of the main reasons for which he has allowed it. This verse says in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. God allows heresies such as these false secular psychological beliefs and other things that are com coming into our church to prove who is the true and who is the false. He wants to distinguish between who are his people and who is not. And one way to do that is to allow these things to come in. Another thing about secular psychology to keep in mind is that as we got to the end of this earth's history, it is essential that we learn to depend more upon God than upon man. And if we don't recognize this, when that final test comes to every soul, which we are told will come, and we're so busy following man, we will not recognize that this is the time to turn our attention away from what man says to what God says. Are you all following what I'm saying? So you have to be careful. I like what um, Elder Frizee says. If some of you may have heard of Elder W.D. Frizee who started Wildwood. He says, now if we, if we get in the habit of having men solve our problems, what will be built in our characters? Dependence on whom? On man. And the devil has set every agency and operation to get us into that place, he goes on to say, where whatever our problem is, whether it's a financial problem, a health problem, an emotional problem, a happiness problem, a religious problem, whatever it is, that there's some man or combination of men that can solve it for us. That's what Satan wants us to do. And when we run to the so philosophies of secular psychology, he's conditioning our minds to look at what men can do to help us with, help us with our problems. And this is a perfect trap to set us in because when that time comes for us to follow what God says as opposed to what my, man is saying, we've been so conditioned to follow man's wisdom that we won't recognize that this is the time that we have to follow what God says. Are you all following me? So that's another reason why we have to move away from the dangers of secular psychology. There's an end time um, implication here. 
And we're coming close to that time. There are all kind of laws being passed. There are all kind of things that are being said. And unless we start going back to God's word and comparing everything we hear to God's word, we're going to get swept up with the crowd, brothers and sisters. So this is more than just understanding how we can gain true healing. It also has some end time impl implications. It also has some possible and eternal implications. And that's what I want to be impressed in your mind as we talk about these things. So finally, I want to end with some quotes from Ephesians 6. I'm just going to pull some, a few verses from there, and I want to end with that, where, where the Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We have to put on that armor in order to be able to stand against the wiles of secular psychology. In order, be against, in order to be able to stand against these philosophies that are coming in that are not in accordance to God's word. And he goes on to say, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Brothers and sisters, stand on God's word. Stand on his principle. Stand on his wisdom, not man's wisdom not man's way, and you will find that you'll be healthier and happier in this life, and your eternity, your eternal happiness will also be more secured. My prayer is that you will do so, that everything you hear you will test, and that the secular psychological principles will not be one that will fool or, dece or deceive you. Amen? Amen? I pray that for each one of you. Now, if you're interested in more information, I want to again share my website. It is B-I-N goodhealth.com. That's B-I-N goodhealth.com. I'm willing to talk with you. I do um, information. I share information. I have resources on there that can help you with um, psychological issues or just help you function better mentally. Check it out, okay? And I pray that all of this has been a blessing to you and that you'll be able to not only keep this to yourself but share it with others. Amen? Amen. Let's close with a um, closing prayer. Bow with me. Father, thank you so much again for what you've given to us. And we pray that we may recognize that all that we need, you have. We praise you and we thank you for the wonderful messages you've given to us through your word, through inspired writings, and through true science. Now be with each person who is listening. Bless them, guide them, and keep them that they may recognize that only what we do for Christ and that is based on your word will last. In the name of Jesus, your son, we do pray. Amen.